I thought we would speak with, in the context of these three parshiot of Shmot, Va'er, of Bo, culminating with Yitziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus Redemption, about three different elements. Number one, the leadership. In this case, Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron Akoin, and of course, this Canaan, the elders. That would be facet number one. Facet number two would be the people, the people of Israel. How did they fare through this whole thing? And finally, of course, Almighty God and His response and how He intervened and what lessons He wanted us to learn from this great episode of Yitziat Mitzrayim. Now, keep in mind before we begin that the exodus from Egypt, although it, 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 it took place more than 3,000 years ago, yet it is so central to our religion. There's just endless. Uh, we have a mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, to tell the story on the Leil HaPesach, on the 14th, going into the 15th of Nisan. It doesn't end there, though. We have Zachet HaYom HaZeh Sheyetzat Mitzrayim, every day of the year. We have a mitzvah commandment to remember the redemption. On top of that, the Ramban, Nachmanides, is of the opinion that the reason why we count the months, starting from Nisan, is because Nisan is the month of Geulah, of redemption. And every time we count the month, we actually remember what happened at the time of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Shabbat! We recite Kiddush, Zecha Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Tzitzis, Tzfilim, Zecha Yitzhak Mitzrayim. The fundamentals of our faith are connected to Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Tens of mitzvot. This achartem, you remember, ki heaven, you were slaves in Mitzrayim. And finally, of course, perhaps the culmination of, of miracle of miracles is the splitting of the Red Sea at the time of, of Yitziat Mitzrayim. So this is something awesome. We mentioned last time that the Rabbani's introduction says that this book of Shemot is not just a book of Galut, of going into exile, but it's also the book of Gitulah redemption. And surely the redemption reaches a very, very intense pinnacle. In Parshat Bo, going on to Bishalak, that transition. So let's start with leadership. That's my first, uh, my first concept that I want to address tonight. Leadership, of course, begins with Moshe Rabbeinu. He's born under very dire, difficult circumstances in Jewish history. Paro has already decreed officially as a state law, Kol Haben Ha'ilod Ha'yorot Ha'shlichu. The male children are meant to be drowned in the night. And so, a little baby is born to bait Levi. They look at the baby. And the Torah testifies. Vayar te'yel kitovu. Two dimensions to kitovu. Number one, nolad mogul. A certain inner spiritual perfection. He doesn't need to be circumcised. He doesn't need a brit milah. Brit milah means, represents symbolically man's effort to perfect himself. But Moshe doesn't need that. And the Ramah is famous for writing amongst the Yud Gimel Ikrin, the 13 principles of our faith, that Moshe Rabbeinu reaches the highest level of prophecy, of shleimut, of perfection, of anyone before him and anyone after him. But it's not just his personal level of piety. It doesn't end with his close, intimate relationship with God. Kitovu says Rashi in the name of Chazal, Nitmalea Bayit Kulo Ora. The house was filled with light. Moshe Rabbeinu shares his greatness, his insight. He's dramatic. He's powerful. He's the giver of the law. He's going to have a close relationship. As Yisro points out, the people are waiting a lot to get their opportunity to spend some time with Moshe Rabbeinu. He's the awe. He's the light. Not just personal and private. Not just a selfish kind of pile. But Moshe Rabbeinu represents, for all time, the leader par excellence, who cares for his flock, who loves his people. He's willing to sacrifice for them. He's going to break the luchot, hoping that God will judge him favorably. 
At one critical point in history, he says to God, if you're going to destroy the people, Mathaini no me sin for wipe me out. He's willing to give up his, everything that's his, everything he worked for, only for the sake of his people. He represents the Shliach HaKel par excellence. Who is the Shliach HaKel? The messenger of God. He sent on a mission. And then, he sort of, in a very pious and humble way, removes himself. His goal is the people of Israel. It's not personal glory that he seeks. And so it was with every Shliach HaKel who was ever sent on a leadership role to be the message of Almighty God throughout our history. You're sent on a mission, mission impossible, you go out there, you do what you have to do, and then you rescind, rescind into the background, into the shadow. You become part of this enormous community of, of Israel that spans all the generations. And we know that Moshe Rabbeinu, in his very first episode, as a young man, according to some of the Rishonim, he was 12 years old, when he went out to see how his brethren would do and destroys the Mitzvah. Heroic, courageous, doing what he feels is right, is just, and he's willing to suffer the consequences. And they're very difficult. He's out of the loop, He's running away as a fugitive for a period of 70 years in Midian, in a foreign country, leaving the warmth and the shelter and the protection of the house of power. Why? Because that Mitzri had the audacity, and Moshe witnessed it, of raising his hand against the Jew. We know that there are seven mitzvot that are given to Bnei Yoh. One of them is low tzach, that thou shalt not kill. It doesn't seem to be that this mystery was killing a Jew, but he raised his hand against the Jew, perhaps wounding him. And that itself is worthy of severe punishment. Moshe made it like a true king, takes the law into his own hands, executes justice. How did he kill the mixture? According to one opinion, the agro fico. He smote it with his hand. Pure, unadulterated power. Physical power, physical strength. According to another opinion, his cure all of it has shame. He enunciated the holy and effable name of God. Perhaps according to that second opinion, Moshe Rabbeinu felt that he couldn't judge this mixture to death for a capital punishment. He left the Tashem. He says, I am going to enunciate the, the name of God. Now the heavenly court will decide whether this mystery should live or die. And I'll prove it to you. If Moshe Rabbeinu felt that he was absolutely justified, according to the letter of the law, to destroy the life of this mystery, then why does it say, by Yifa and Kovachal? He looked to the left, he looked to the right. Chazal say, according to Tarsh Peh, the oral tradition, he looked down generations to see if anything good would come out of this mystery. Well, if the mystery was doomed to die, if he was guilty of a capital crime, then there's no justification for the fact that later on in the generations something good is going to come out. That's an irrelevant kind of judgment call. You can't spare the life of someone who's convicted and condemned to die simply because down the line he'll have an offspring who's worthy. But the answer is, that Moshe Rabbeinu was vacillating at this point. He didn't know is the mystery actually, technically, guilty of a capital crime or not. So his care all of us a shame. He mentions the name of God. And then comes the meeting between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Moshe Rabbeinu at the sea. Seven days Moshe Rabbeinu stands with HaKadosh Baruch debating back and forth Moshe, you be the leader of Kali Yisrael, you be their redeemer. And Moshe refuses. One argument after the other. Lo ishtvar manochi, I don't have to speak, I'm not a diplomat. Kvad pel anochi, 
And then he starts accusing the Jewish people, they won't accept me, they won't believe in me, they'll ask me questions, how do I prove it? And God Almighty, just as we say in yeshivas, slugs him off. He just rejects every single one. Until the seventh day. On that very last critical moment, Moshe Rabbeinu came up with an, a winning art. He says, Shlach no tishlach. Rashi says, send a different messenger. Someone that you, God, are reliant upon. He's dependable. He's been plugging away on behalf of the Jewish people for many decades during my absence in Midian. And not only that, he is so beloved upon so well accepted in the Jewish nation. Perfect leader. He's your man. And he's my brother. And not only that, he's three years old. Say Chazal. What Moshe was arguing, very beautifully, how can you skip over the older brother and appoint me, the younger one, as the Redeemer of Israel? Surely Derech Eretz Kadmol Torah. The feelings of my older brother. He'll surely be slighted. He was overlooked. He'll be jealous of me. And Moshe says God. You've underestimated the heart of your brother Aaron. Aaron will not feel any judgment. Vihine, take a look. Aaron is coming out here to greet you as the leader of Israel, as the appointed redeemer. The Sawak believer and his heart is overwhelmed with joy over the fact that you, Moshe Abedin, have been chosen as the leader of Kalis. So no jealousy whatsoever. As I'll point out that as a result of this great love of Aaron, he was Zoha, he merited the Urim Vitumim, one of the greatest vessels of the Beit HaMikdash of the Mishkan, which would sit on his heart. Because Aaron was pure heart. He was pure love. Moshe and Aaron complement each other. The leadership is going to be one. Surely Moshe plays a dominant role. But yet, Aaron is there with him. Aaron is going to implement many of the battles. Aaron is going to be the leader of Israel who's kind of like, if I can use a marshal, a metaphor, the Chesidah Shereb. You know, we have Litvaks and we have Chesidah. Moshe Rabbeinu was more of a Litvak type of guy. You know what I mean? He was the strict disciplinarian. He was the teacher. He could formulate ideas of the Torah, complex ones, in sentences, in paragraphs. Aaron represents a different kind of leadership. Aaron is close to the people. Never distant, never aloof. Always generating a warm feeling of closeness to the people. Aaron is the Ohev Shalom and the Rodev Shalom. He knows how to make peace between people who are arguing. And Moshe represents the leader the teacher, like no other teacher we've ever had. I would like to share with you a metric. I think I gave it out to you. If not, here's an extra copy, perhaps. You need another one. The metric speaks about three different great personalities throughout the history of our people. One is Reuven, the other is Aaron, and the third is Boaz. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Lim Torah Derech Eretz. The Torah taught us a rule, a golden rule. In this context, I think Derech Eretz means how to perform mitzvot. My friends, we're encountering here, we're addressing a very central Issue. How does a person perform its vote? What should be my attitude? Shekshayei Adam Osem Mitzvah when a person implements a mitzvah, Yehei Oseh Otah Belev Shalem. 
He should do it with a full heart. He should never take it for granted. He shouldn't be laid back about it. We have myriads of opportunities to fulfill God's will. Do we take advantage of them? She'ilu hoya Ruven yodeya if only Ruven could have known. Shakadosh Baruch Hu machtiv That God is recording his actions. And where? In the Torah, in the Book of Eternity. Vayishma Ruven vayitzileni adam. Ruven saves his younger brother Yosef. He didn't know that he was being recorded. Hayato ano umalichoy tzadiv. He would simply put him on his back and walk him back to Father Jacob. Piggyback style. V'ilu hoya Aaron yodea. Shakados Baruch Hu machtiv alav. God is recording his response when he finds out that Moshe was chosen as the redeemer of Israel. Hinei u yotzei lekratecha. Is betupimu v'mecholot haya yotzei lekrato. Then surely Aaron would have gone out with a seven-piece band to receive his brother Moshe. If only Boaz would know that God is writing and recording his actions. You remember when Ruth comes from Moab and she comes into the field of Boaz to try to collect some barley, some wheat, some grain. And they gathered together, Boaz gathered together some Kelly into a, uh, into a basket. Kelly is probably what we would call today bran. He would have fed Ruth roast duck, a seven course meal, the most lavish banquet. Here are three individuals, personalities in Tanakh, who perform mitzvot at a very critical time at a very critical junction. We'll focus on Aaron. If Aaron hadn't actually come out to greet Moshe with joy in his heart, if Aaron would have done what we would have called the natural response, to feel a, a twang of jealousy in his heart, then perhaps this whole endeavor of Moshe Rabbeinu being chosen as the leader, as the redeemer, would have fallen through. Because Moshe Rabbeinu's argument was a perfect one. But Aaron comes forward, flying colors, and teaches us that we have to always take into consideration the opportunities that we have to do mitzvah. I want to discuss with you a very fascinating idea that I think jumps out of a puzzle. If you open up to Shmot Vav, Puzzle Yid Gimel, there's a very odd structure in the Apostle. It says there, Vaitaber Hashem al Moshe v'al Aaron, Vaitzavim el Bnei Yisrael. And then, the Apostle goes on to say, V'al Paro melech Mitzrayim, lo tziyat Bnei Yisrael meretz Mitzrayim. Go tell Paro, let my people go. But the Apostle opens in the ratio with Vaitzavim, El Bnei Yisrael, there was some sort of command to the people of Israel. What was the substance of that command? What was its content? So the Yushalmi on this passage makes the following comment. al Sivam, what did God command the people? al Pashat Shimuach Avadim, on the mitzvah of freeing one's slave. You know, there's something called an Ebed Ivri, a Jewish slave, who sold for seven years, and at the termination of the seven years, he's freed by his master. That's a mitzvah, that's a command from the Torah. And for some reason, unbeknown to us, when was that mitzvah, Shiluach Avadim, given to the people of Israel? Right before they left Mitzvah. When were the other 612 mitzvah given? At Har Sinai. So the question begs itself. Why was this mitzvah singled out to be given to B'nai Yisrael before they left Mitzrayim? Says Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, the great Rosh Hashiv of Mir, this mitzvah is one of the most difficult challenging of them all. Imagine, you have a slave, he works for you, he services you, you rely on him, he takes care of everything. And true, this Ebed yearns for freedom, 
But it's very difficult to free an heaven. He's in your domain. You relied on him. You got used to him. Now you're going to free him? Very difficult challenge. Says Reb Chaim Shalevitz, this mitzvah needs chizuk. It needs to be strengthened by some incredibly powerful, profound commitment on the, on the part of the Jewish people. When could that chizuk come about? Right before the Jews would leave Mitzvah. Here was a nation over two centuries oppressed, enslaved, yearning for freedom. They at that moment could appreciate, could feel what it's like for an heaven to yearn for freedom. They at that moment, feeling the elation, the excitement of being able to breathe independence, they would know what it means to commit themselves to the mitzvah of Shiluah HaVadim, to free their slaves. And that Kabbalah, that acceptance of the mitzvah of Shiloh Heaven was so profound, it was so powerful, that it would last for decades, no, for centuries, no, for millennia, all of Jewish history. No matter how far removed we are from Yitzhak Mitzrayim, we're still connected, we're still impressed. The Jew is at the forefront of every movement of let my people go. I remember my youth, the socialist movements, the movements for freedom, the civil rights movements. Where were the Jews? They were right there up front. Because the concept of Shiluah Havadim is so ingrained, all because it was given to us at the time when we could feel for the mitzvah in a personal way. And I think we could extrapolate from this a very important lesson. That a person has to grab onto a moment a moment of intense feeling, of elation, of being high, and say, at that moment, I'm going to commit myself to a certain mitzvah, because that's when I feel it. A person has to let his experiences seep into his soul, and uplift him, and he has to take them with him. There's got to be a memorial, some sort of sign, so you can constantly remember what he felt like. So many different mitzvot, as we said before, to remind us of what it was like to be an Eved and now to breathe the air of freedom so that we'll treat others in the right way. The exodus from Egypt to the entire story of the exile in Egypt and the slavery is one long process of developing a moral sensitivity in the very spiritual fiber of the Jewish people to engender those sensitivities. We went through the Kura Barza of Mitzrayim. The Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin a story about a certain individual called Palti ben Lach. How many people by show of hands have ever heard of Palti ben Lach? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> He's actually only famous because the Gemara in Sanhedrin made him famous. The Gemara says, the Ata Lisal Kulono, the Poski Mishle, we sing it every Friday night, Ze Palti Ben Lash. What's the story of Palti Ben Lash? The Gemara tells us. The daughter of Shaul Hamel, Michal Bat Shaul, was married off to Dov. They had Erisin, they never had Nisuin, but nevertheless, she was a married woman. But Shaul Hamel, because of his enmity towards Dov, it seemed Dov as a, as a threat, refused to recognize that marriage. And he came up with arguments to undermine that marriage. But truthfully, according to Jewish law, Michal Bat Shaul was married to Dov. What did Shaul do? He married this girl off to Palti ben Laish. Palti didn't want to marry her. But he was supposed to be forced to do so. Because Shaul, the king of Israel, had demanded it. Now imagine the situation. Palti ben Laish knows very well that Michal is a married woman. So the Gemara Sanhedrin says, how did he do it? How did he live under one roof with a woman who legally, in quotation marks, was his wife? But he knew that she was a married woman. How was he able to overcome temptation in the privacy of his home? And the Gemara says that Palti ben Laish 
did something to make sure that he wouldn't overstep his bounds. He took a sword, and he pierced it into the ground, this gigantic sword. And he declared, if any one of us will cross over this line, he or she will be killed by this sword. Pretty bright thing to do. There's only one problem. If Palti Belayish would ever have a situation of temptation, if the evil inclination they told would get the best of him with intense passion, he put the cherub in, he could easily take the cherub out. Says of Chaim Shulev, it's a beautiful instinct. What was the point to this cherub? To the sword in the ground? Palti, when he had to marry Michal, was in a very intense state of religious dedication, committed to observe the laws of morality and purity. But he needed a symbol. He needed something that would remind him of that feeling, of that intense commitment. And so the cherub, the sword in the ground, would always remind him of his original feelings. I remember I had a student once, many years ago, a girl who came to Israel. She stayed for a year and a half, very intensely in love with Eretz Yisrael, with the land of Israel. But after a year and a half, it was time to go back to Chuzim. And she looked for a sign, some symbol, that would remind her of her feelings for Eretz Yisrael. So you know what she did? She didn't change her clock. Her watch was on Israel time for five years until finally she came back to Israel as a married woman and didn't have to change her car. I remember a student of mine once told me that after a year in Israel he was afraid that going back to college and to the regular routine of life he would forget his immense feelings, his intensity for love and passion to all that he got from Israel, the Torah that he studied, the closest to the Kotel Amaravi. So what did he do? On the plane back, after a year in Israel, he wrote himself a letter. And in that letter, he described his feelings, what that year in Israel meant to him. And from time to time, when he would feel that maybe his emotions were dwindling, were waning, he would take out that letter. And somehow it would put him back into that mindset, those intense feelings and emotions that he had when he had to leave Israel. The Av, the father of this whole concept of making a sign so that we remember, we immortalize those moments of elevation, is in the Torah itself. The Torah tells us in Gracia, following the Mabal, the flood, that God declares, Rashi explains, Kishetalev it'll ever cross my mind, says Almighty God, to destroy the world. I will observe the rainbow. And I will recall the commitment I made to all of mankind never to destroy the earth. And the question is obvious. God needs a sign. God can forget. There's no forgetfulness saying But the answer is Hashem is teaching us the way. He's setting the pattern that we should imitate. Just as God set himself a sign when he felt such a tremendous commitment so we should set ourselves a sign in every aspect of our life. Something to cling to. The Gemara tells us at the end of Pesach Ezu ben Olam Abba, who deserves a share in the world to come? And the Gemara lists three different categories of people, all of whom deserve a share, a guaranteed a place in the world to come. The first is Hamagadel Bon of Letalmet Torah. He raises his children with Torah study. Very, very sensitive. I mean, we know the centrality of Torah study. He deserves a place. Number two, Hadar Be'eretz Yisrael. 
he sets up his domicile in the land of Israel. Once again, we know the centrality of living in Eretz Yisrael. The Gemara says that you could sell a, a sacred Torah to allow a couple to move to Israel. And mitzvah Yishu of Eretz Yisrael is shkula kineged kol a mitzvah that outweighs them all. But then the Gemara is a third category. Hamishayir mikidusha lavdalt. When he makes kiddush on Friday night, he saves some of the wine for Abdul on Moses Shabbos. So I asked my father, may he rest in peace, Dad, very nice thing. Ezu Chacham Aros, I know that you should always think it out, prepare for the future, down the line in 24 hours, you can make Abdullah, save some wine. But why does he deserve a portion in all of our buff for that? It's anticlimactic in comparison. It pales in comparison to the other two categories. And my father said something I'll never forget. He said when a person enters into the Shabbat and he recites Kiddush, it's a moment of sanctification, of elevation. He realizes the next 24 hours and change are going to be hours of intense relationships with God, he's leaving behind him all the all the machadikazak and all the weekday stuff, no monies and no stocks and no insurance problems and worrying about where to park the car and the worst of all the cell phone that goes off every five minutes. And I know a person in my family that has only one cell phone, but if she had three they would all go off at the same time. And the greatest thing about Shabbos is there's no cell phones. So it's a moment of Kiddush. But you know what? That's not the challenge. That's no good. To enter into moments of Kiddush. To go to the Ari Mikvah in Sfat. To go to the Kotel and take a tour of the Kotel tunnels. And the tar- tour guide tells you that you are literally feet away from the Kodesh Kadoshim, from the Eben Ashti of the holiest place, and feel elevation, and feel intense passion and commitment. That's no good. You'd have to be totally unsensitive not to feel those moments of elation. But the Kutz is not Kiddush. The real challenge is Havdola. Separating yourself from Kiddush and Kamiyot, going back to the the days of Master, the secular mundane days, every day, drudgery, a little bit of the nine to five work, day after day, to somehow take something from the Shabbos and have it penetrate and uplift you during the days to come. That's the person who's a Ben Olam Abar. In a few weeks' time, I'm going to Israel to marry off a student of mine. He went to that yeshiva, I don't know how many years ago. It's, it's a great symptom. He's 33 years old. So you can imagine we're all happy. And I'm going to tell him the following. I'm going to say to him, under the chuppah, you and your kala, feel the kedusha, the sanctity of marriage, the chuppah. Chuppah is, is like the chuppah of Harsinai. It's a, it's a duplicate, it's a replica of, of being close to Hashem. And you'll feel that his kachu is the robos had nefesh, the elevation. That's no kunz. It's not even a kunz to go through the shivas. You know, I in the first year of Shona Rishona, and she's a kalan, you're a chosen, wonderful! But you've got a life of, ahead of you. And that's where you have to learn how to take something from the kiddush and bring it into the havdolo. So the message, I think, of the mitzvah of Shiluach Avodim given dafka at the moment of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is a profound one. And we all in our own life have to find, our own lives have to find our subjective ways of taking that which is sacred and have it spill over. Have it impact our souls in such a way that it carries over from Kiddush to Abdullah. We spoke a little bit about Moshe Rabbeinu, a little bit about Aram, but we're not finished. What about this case? The elders. They too were leaders of class. <coughs> and here the story is very complicated. It's no longer Moshe Rabbeinu representing Shlemut, the teacher par excellence, willing to sacrifice his life to the people. It's no longer Aaron Akohen, no jealousy, a heart of gold, warmth, the Rebbe who loves us, 
who makes soul in peace, it's much more complicated. This Canaan are a bit raw. And so, this Canaan are called upon to escort Moshe and Aaron into power. Moshe and Aaron are going on a major mission to save the Jewish people. And where are the elders? If you take a look at the Pesukim, as you'll see, they're not to be found. I always think to myself, you know, the elders, this Canaan, were busy. They were very active people in the community. They surely had plenty on their agenda. And here was a responsibility to go, together with Moshe and Aaron, in front of Paro. And maybe, perhaps, they were too busy. But maybe, perhaps, they didn't sense the awesome responsibility that was laid on their shoulders. Imagine you, you, you meet a Jew, and just a haphazard, faceless Jew, and you ask the Jew, well, in the priorities of, of Jewish communal life, what's pressing? What are the needs that we should be responsible to generate, to commit ourselves to? So some might say, you know, there's a financial crisis out there in the world. Some might talk about security and the problems of getting on planes and getting off planes. And some might talk about the weather conditions and global warming and environmental this. And I, I can think of a list of very important issues. Be kind to animals. There are so many issues. Ah, but a Jew who feels a real responsibility. And you ask that Jew, as a representative of Kali, so the people of Israel, to give me a system, a set of priorities. What should we be dedicating ourselves to? What should we be thinking about? What are the issues, the problems, the challenges that face our people? And he puts number one on his list, the fact that the little state of Israel is surrounded by 80 million Arabs. He puts on the front of his, his list the fact that in America, some, not so many years ago, they talked about 6 million Jews. Where are they? Assimilation that's eating away at our people. My son was in Portland, Oregon, doing cure for two years. And there was a young lady from the community who was coming to Israel on a program. Not a particularly religious girl yet. I mean, she has lots of potential. And our son asked up us to invite her for Shabbat. She'll have a place to be and so forth and so on. She comes from an area in Portland which is very heavily Jewish. The Jewish population is by far the majority. She went to public school, just graduated, and she tells me the following story. She says that the school has thousands of Jews. They have once a month a club out for Jewish students. How many students do you think show up? Less than four. But then she adds another comment. And I'm about to cry when I tell this. She says if any of those 40 some odd Jews will marry Jews, it's purely coincidental. By pure accident. This is where we're at. This is what we're facing. And so the elders had an opportunity to be part of a glorious, grandiose plan of Almighty God. To go into power with Moshe and Aaron, the two greatest leaders of all history, of all time. And plead the case of the Jewish people. Later on, according to Chazal, they were punished. When Moshe gets up to the mountain at Harsinai, the Torah commands, No one goes beyond this point. No one, not even this Canaan. You didn't accompany Moshe into power to suffer the de difficult challenge of, of getting in front of that powerful evil king on behalf of Jewish people, you're not going to be here climbing up the mountain of Hashem. A Jew has to know and the sense of responsibility when to come forward. But the story is complicated. Because who was this king? Let's just think about it. This king of Jews who Paro and his taskmen commanded to beat the Jews, to force them into slave labor. And they refused to do so. And they would bow down their heads and expose themselves 
to take those blows that were meant for other Jews. You know, the trouble with us is that we, we don't put ourselves into a time machine and go back into history and really feel it. You know, we read the Haggadah, the Seder, and the Sipritis Mitzrayim, and every day we were meant to mem- remember this great exodus, this great episode. But do we put ourselves back into, their, into that mindset? My friend Rabbi Baruch Chait published a Haggadah for children. I don't know if you've ever seen it with pictures. And he has, you know, it's artistic work. He didn't write the artwork, he did the rest of the Haggadah. I think it was Diane Liff. I'm not sure who did the artwork right now, I don't remember. And it's a picture of an old Jew getting beaten by an Egyptian taskmaster. And it's just so real, you know. This is for children, coming off. And I, I think adults should also be exposed to this kind of thing. It's not just for children. Because the mix of Sipri and Sis Mitzrayim is high of Adam Liros and Satsu Kilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim. That's the level we have to achieve. The Ramban in Parsha's book emphasizes time after time how much, how crucial it is that we link up constantly to Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Always thinking. And then we get to the next stage. Roman numeral number two. And that's Kalalis. Where's Kalalis so in the picture? On the one hand, the Torah testifies that Hashem heard Na'akatam. He heard their cries, Na'akatam. Z'aka. But on the other hand, V'lo Yachlu, and they can't hear Moshe Rabbein. Now, Voda Kosha, the Kotz Ruach. Were the Jews a prayerful people? Did they understand? Were they capable of prayer? Perhaps their spirits were so broken that they couldn't pray. Prayer, according to Allah, requires tremendous intellectual capability to be able to formulate ideas, paragraph after paragraph, organize logic. You don't just jump in front of the king, the king of kings. But there's something else. Dovrenel says, Shomeat filat adecha kol basar yavo. Kol basar. Kol basar means, and I heard from my Rebbe many times, Rav Salvechik used to always say that kol basar refers to even animals. An animal too lets out a yelp, a cry from despair, when he feels a sense, or she feels a sense of, of danger. True, the Jewish people were incapable of an intellectual prayer. But they let out a zakah. According to Hasidut, the shofar blowing on Rosh Hashanah is that kind of a kol, it's called a kol pashut, a simple sound that pierces through all the olamos and goes all the way to the Kisya Akkab and the throne of God. And so it was with that sound, that cry that the Jewish people let forward, forward in the shrine, almost as a natural, intuitive response. And did the Jews accept Moshe Rabbeinu? There were times when they were ambivalent, but basically, as I spoke, we promised Moshe. The Jews were waiting for this. They wanted to know, Mishmecha, who is your name, O God? They were curious, even in that broken state. If God was now remembering the covenant that they had heard about from their forefathers, the password that was transmitted over the decades, over the centuries. And the Gemara says, the Medrash says, Lo shinu eshmam vesmal bushan vesel shonam. They didn't change their names. They didn't take on Egyptian names. They dressed differently. Were they religious and pious? Did they observe the mitzvot as the avot did? I doubt it. It's highly unlikely. The Zohar speaks about it, and the Memtesh Shari Tuma, the impact of the culture of Egypt on the Jewish people. But despite it, all they were unique. They were a separate entity. According to one statement of Chazal, why were they chosen for freedom? Because lo dibru lashon harazel zeh. They were unified. One Medrash tells us that when they went through the Yamsuf, at the time of Kriyas Yamsuf, they were in 12 different highways. 
the water came up, separating each line from the next, but it was transparent. And why? Because every Jew wanted to know how the next Jew was faring in this whole situation. They cared about each other. There was a sense of unity. I once had a student by the name of Miles. I don't know if in Canada anybody has that name. In America, a few people have it. You know, you have it, Miles. So I remember he got off the boat, came to Yeshiva, and we were going through the list. Well, as you do on the first day, make sure who came, you know, the registration. So Rabbi Fold, who's the dean of students, gets to the name Miles. He raises his hand. So Rabbi Fold says to him, what's your name? He says, Miles. And this goes back and forth. And Miles wasn't stopping what's going on over here. And Rabbi Fold is finally getting very frustrated. He says, Miles, what's the name on your Matseva after you've been here for 120 years? Oh, now he understands. He says, my name is Shlomo. Oh, you do have a name. <laughs> We're so part of the culture that we live in that we forget our names, our true names. I met a guy this job, this is here in Toronto, he said his name is Tommy. I, I said, what's your Hebrew name? I figured two of you. He says, no, Yitzchak. I couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> we take on all sorts of names. And during this episode, the ten makos, Vayach bein Hashem et leiv power. What's that all about? The Rama dedicates almost an entire chapter in Hilchus Tshuva, the laws of repentance, to the concept of freedom of choice. Freedom of choice is the essence, it's the cornerstone of our whole religion. One of the 13 principles of the faith that we must accept is reward and punishment. Well, reward and punishment presumes that a person can make their own decisions. And here it says, Vayach bein Hashem et leiv power. So the rabbi explains that at a certain point, Paro forfeited this great merit, this great privilege of freedom of choice. So what's the mush? I mean, let's just see if we can bring it home. How does a person get to this point in which he loses his freedom of choice? So could you imagine walking down one of the streets and you notice a very tall building and you figure, you know what, maybe not during the winter it wouldn't be so exciting, but during a nice spring day, a, a summer day, let's go up to the top of the building. There must be a fantastic view of the city from up there. So you climb up the steps or you take the elevator and you get up to the top and lo and behold, you're enjoying the view, it's wonderful, the breeze. But you look at your clock and you notice that it is getting very late. The sun is about to set. You have an appointment. Maybe you have to dive up. So what do you do? You make the calculation quickly that if you're going to come down the steps the normal way, you'll never make it on time. So you decide, you know what? There's a not much quicker way of getting down. So you come closer and closer to the edge. And then you put one foot over the ledge. And then you look down and everything looks so tiny on the bottom. Even the cars. Can't see any people. And then you put another leg over the ledge. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. I'll be down in the gym. And then you put one foot forward, and before you know it, you're down. And you're down to the 90th floor, and the 80th floor, and the 70th floor, and you're feeling the air. It's just wonderful. Oh. But then all of a sudden, the floor is getting very close. It's moving up at the speed of light. What can you do to change? <laughs> Too late. That's why Yahweh Hashem is like You have freedom of choice up to a certain point. At some point, it's beyond return. You can't do it anymore. That's the way nature is. The law of gravity says that you're going to be pulled down. It's irreversible. It's unchanging. And finally, last but not least, the most important element of the equation, of course, is that Kodesh Baruch who is God, redeeming the people from Egypt. And here, my friends, the Ramban is absolutely eloquent. He describes people who deny God's creative powers. 
They think the universe is eternal. He probably has reference to Aristotle and the Greeks. And then he mentions people who believe, yes, there is a God. And yes, God created the world, but God doesn't have power over this world. Hashem is not interested in this lowly existence. There's no hashkacha pratit. There's no supervision and divine providence. God's not involved in our daily life. So you have all sorts of deniers. Says the Ramban. Comes the story. The episode in Jewish history of the Eser Makas. Of the Exeus Mitzrayim. You know, the question is, why? Why can God just take us out of Mitzrayim in one fell swoop? Why time after time and Makkah after Makkah? The whole long story. The answer is, Laman Yedu. That we should know what is the power of Hashem? She sees us all outside the Kirbachem. If God can change nature, He must be the author of nature. Hence, we prove God is creator. If God is interested in man, then and only then does it make sense that He would intervene in the history of the people of Israel. So the miracles of Mitzrayim reveal the power of God in so many different ways. The Maharami Prague is famous for dividing it up into many different areas of the universe. God's power, His intervention, His honest-to-goodness concern to save the Jewish people. All of our faith is based on this. Since the Ramban, that's why we wear tefillin with the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim in our tefillin. And that's why we have Shabbos, which is Zechel Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And that's why we count the months of the year from Nisa in the month of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And that's why we have not only once a year a mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim, but every day of the year a mitzvah of Zechiras Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We recite the parsha of Ayomer, the parsha of Tzitzis, and we conclude, Ani Hashem Elokeichem, I am the power. Hashem say, Sichem Eretz Mitzrayim. The whole Kenyan, the acquisition of God over our people. Kinesher Yair Kino, that God protected us as the eagle protects its young, its fledglings above it as it flies high in the sky. This is that covenantal relationship between the Jewish people and Almighty God. If we can take with us during the reading of these parshiot an intense commitment to all the beliefs, the fundamentals of that faith, that underlie the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. If we can have a sense of gratitude and dedication, commit ourselves to the Tariyad Mitzvah, to constantly remember God's power and His close intimate relationship with the Jewish people, His redemption over us. If we can remember the story of our leaders, of a Moshe, of an Aaron, of the Zikadim, willing to, out of total love for that people, sacrifice everything that's dear to them. And our ability of the, of the Jew to first of all be unique, to be separate, not to mold with the nations, and finally to declare God's oneness. Then in Mirza Hashem, all of those Kabbalot that we spoke about before, that we took upon ourselves at moments of elevation, will come to be. And God will remember His bridge and bring about the ultimate redemption, the time of Mashiach. And Kibbutz Gold, the Jews even from Portland, Oregon, will come back to see that glorious day. At the time they were building the Beit Hamikdash, been here again, Amen. Thank you very much.